And also another point, the necessity of tafsir. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came during that time, the early Islamic time, and he explained whatever he could. He explained to people what the message of each and every verse is. So the issue now here is that he was the the best mufassir. He was the only mufassir at that time. And now we do not have him in, uh, with us. He is not with us. So now there is nobody to explain to us what the message of Quran is. But Alhamdulillah, as Prophet Muhammad said that, you know, the inheritors of Prophet. Who are the inheritors of the Prophet? The, the scholars. So they now... Prophet is not alive, but the inheritance, the knowledge of Prophet Muhammad is now with the scholars. They are the inheritors of the Prophet. So they took up the responsibility of providing the tafsir. So that is one reason. So nobody can say, hey, you know, Prophet is gone, so there's no need to do tafsir. No, there is a need. And also, another point here is that Quran is very eloquent. You know, if you want to make something beautiful, you know, you make it you know, when, when the, uh, there is eloquence in the language, it really beautifies something. Quran is also, when it comes to eloquence, that is the best. You know, Quran is a masterpiece because it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But with, uh, when we say uh, something is eloquent, what happens is people who don't have good knowledge or good uh, grasp of language, they will not be able to understand few things because you need a little explanation for them. Like now, people are not that eloquent. Earlier times, especially Arabs, they used to be very eloquent, right? Very good recite poetry and so on. So that's the reason when the beauty is there in, in Quran, but you need some explanation for that. And also, Asbab al Nuzul as well. You know, sometimes you need to know what exactly uh, something, when, what exactly the context was, when, why was this verse revealed in the first place. So sometimes you read a verse, you're like, I don't really know what it's trying to mean, because you don't know in what circumstances what, what, that uh, verse was revealed. Like I have an example. For example, uh, during the... There, there is this verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, I mentioned earlier when I was discussing, dis discussing uh, Asbab al-Nusul, that... In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that do not, when, when you sight the moon of the Hajj, do not enter your houses from the back. Right? People, I mean, you, like this verse, just read the translation of it, you will you'll see how difficult it is to understand. And he says, it, and it is not righteousness to enter houses from the back, but righteousness is in one who fears Allah and enter houses from their doors and fear Allah that you may succeed. Now if you just read this translation, you have no idea what it's talking. Why is Allah even talking about back doors? How is it relevant to me? So now you need a scholar to explain this, is it not? So scholars will say, okay, this verse, I know what the asbab nuzul was. I know the context wherein it was revealed. And uh, obviously scholars will have a lot of understanding of ahadith and everything. And the actual reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that do not enter from the back doors is because during those days, the mushrikeen, the non-Muslims, they had this tradition that whenever they used to sight the moon of the Hajj, the 12th month, Dhul Hijjah, they used to always have this practice that maybe it was like a bad omen to enter from the doors. They used to come from the back doors as a sort of respect for the month. And, you know, they, they thought it was a bad thing to enter from the doors. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that there is no such thing as bad omen in Islam. They, they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to cancel such kind of customs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse explaining to them that, okay, this is why you should stop that practice. So righteousness, if you want to be righteous, you enter from the door. People used to think, I am more righteous, so I will practice the harder religion and I'll enter from the back door. So that's one reason. They are like, I can give you dozens and dozens of examples. You have no idea when you read that translation what it means, unless scholars explain to you. And also Arabic grammar, Arabic language itself, 
you know, if, if you go to, for example, uh, in, in my workplace, I have a lot of brothers coming from Jordan. They always come and, you know, they leave. There's like our offshore branch. And I ask them sometimes, uh, you know, some of them are really not good in uh, practicing in their religion. And if I recite to them some Quran, right, they probably know like 40% of what I'm saying. Other 60% they have no idea because the language evolves. Some of the words used in the Quran is no longer used. So they have no idea. So even for Arab brothers, even though the, it is Quran is revealed in their language, now the language has evolved so much that they need somebody to explain. Now. Even ourselves, English, right? If we take some book of like Shakespeare or something, you'll not be able to understand it because the English has, you know, it, uh, you know the common words that we use, it's no longer the same. So that is the reason. And also I, uh, we had a whole session of Nasikh and Mansukh as well. Why, uh, you know, uh, some of the verse you will uh, read and say, hey, okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying this, and you will try to apply rulings on them. So, but when you read tafsir, scholars will say, okay, this verse, even though it tells you to do this, but don't follow this verse because this verse has been abrogated. It's no longer applied. So that kind of things only come from scholars. So that's the danger. That's why scholars, some scholars are like, don't even go near tafsir. So that's like an extreme stand. But we have to see really what the majority says. So you, you take opinion from the scholars, you take the tafsir from the scholars and try to implement it in your lives. Understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. But don't try to do it on yourself. And uh, another thing is, uh, sometimes there is one verse and we can understand it in some way, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means something else. For example, this verse in, uh, in uh, Surah number 6, An'am, Surah Al-An'am, verse number 82, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the believers, those who believe and do not mix their belief with injustice. And he goes on from there. And he basically he's saying, those believers who do not mix their belief with injustice. So, when Sahaba, when they heard this verse, they were really worried. They were like, how is it possible that we don't do injustice? Like, all of us are not 100% pious, right? We always sometimes, here or there, we, out of our laziness or out of our mistake, we just do some things which, are, which is not correct. So that's what uh, Sahaba were really uh, afraid of. Injustice, I mean, we cannot be completely, we cannot, nobody can say I'm 100% free from injustice. So they were scared. How is it possible now? So the best Mufassir at that time, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was no comparison for him. He explained to them, it is not that injustice that you think. This injustice means something else. What is that injustice? Inna shirka la zulmun azim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, verily, shirk is a great injustice. So, you see, even though this verse, it was saying, do not mix their belief with injustice, that injustice, the precise meaning of injustice is shirk. Now, how would you know if you just read the translation of that? You need somebody to explain. So, the scholars preserved that knowledge, and until, until this day, we have that knowledge preserved in the tafsir books. By the way, this is tafsir al-Qurtubi. Did I show you the previous one? This is the tafsir tabari, the biggest tafsir ever known. It's like the largest volume. I don't think it's in English. Maybe they are doing it in English. Maybe shortened version. This is the masterpiece. It's the first ever written tafsir. We will, I have a list of books. I'll review it later. And also, we have certain fiqh rulings as well. Wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah al maidah that if somebody commits a, th uh, a theft, what do you do? You cut the hands of it. Right? As for the thief, male or female, cut off their hands. So now, you know, when we read this, some people might ignore it and some people might take it literally. Right? Some people are like, you know, uh, somebody commits a thief, they'll go and start cutting the hand of the thief. But scholars explain detail in tafsir what exactly is meant by this. Yes, in Islamic Sharia, Islamic law system, this is implemented, this law is implemented, but there are a lot of conditions. 
If somebody steals like maybe $100, you don't cut a hand for that. If there is a limit set by scholars, that they say, okay, if the limit crosses this much, then the capital punishment or whatever that punishment is will be applied. So again, so that's the thing. Uh, scholars will explain to you all the detailed rulings, when it applies, what conditions applies, when it is waived. And certain conditions in, for example, when there is at the time of uh, Umar radiallahu anhu, when there was a famine, when there was nothing to eat, he waived this rule. He, he like suspended this rule. He is like, no, the, uh, people might commit a lot of theft because of the condition. So he let go. So the, it's the scholars who can interpret, make istihad. So we have to understand and not take literally from the translation itself. And sometimes there are a lot of multiple meanings uh, within the verse. And, and uh, you know, Allah, it's, it's like a hidden treasure, right? Quran is a hidden treasure. We, we read, it's just, it's just probably like uh, one verse, but inside that verse, there are like so many hidden meanings, so many blessings uh, buried under it. So it's the scholars who take it out. And also, there are some unclear verses that I mentioned about. For example, in this verse that we usually, you know, explain during Ramadan, in this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking about the verse when to, fa when to stop eating during Ramadan, fasting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse that in Surah Al-Baqarah, when the white thread becomes clear from the black thread, what do you do? You stop eating. So the one Sahabi, as you know, he took white thread and black thread literally and put it under the pillow and he was waiting the whole night when will it become clear from each other. And that never happened, right? Because he was trying to understand when should I stop eating. That never happened. So in the morning, he went to Prophet Muhammad and he tried to ask that this didn't happen. What, what really is the meaning? So Prophet Muhammad explained to him, this thread what you basically have in the verse, it is not the actual thread. It means the 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 light the in the horizon. You see, in, in, during the Fajr time, you see this white light going uh, in the, the burst. The, the first initial moments, that's what it is saying. Whenever you see that, you stop eating. So now that's what I meant by unclear verses. Quran is very clear, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, ayatun mubayyinat, but somebody needs to explain certain verses. After you know this explanation, it is clear now. It's no longer unclear. And also the very surah that we often recite in every surah, every salah, because it's very short. <laughs> what does kawthar mean? Verily, we have given you kawthar. What does that kawthar mean? Like, uh, in, from translation, you will have no idea what it means. But kawthar, Prophet Musa Sallam explained, and even the scholars explained, it is basically a, a river in the Akhirah that will be given specifically to Prophet Musa Sallam. And the good Muslims amongst us will be given water out of that river when we are very thirsty and that is the only water that can quench our thirst. So that is again something which only uh, uh, scholars can tell us what exactly certain verses mean. So you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time into these but uh, when a scholar tries to make tafsir of something there are a few things that they do and uh, you know how do they go about making tafsir obviously none of us is qualified but how do they come about making a tafsir so they basically refer a lot of sources first of all the best thing is to do tafsir from quran itself like the example of zulm that i gave the the two verses are within the quran so you try to explain or make tafsir of quran from quran and also you use a hadith as, as well the example of the threats that i just gave that comes from hadith. So they use hadith books. And also, after the uh, Prophet Muhammad passed away, all the knowledge, Sahaba, his companions had it. And that's why uh, we take uh, statements of Sahaba as well. And Arabic language also. Uh, the scholars don't really take the current uh, modern days Arabic, but they need to learn the classical Arabic and everything. So that's that's the something that they refer to again and again, classical dictionaries. And poetry as well, because classical poetry, even though it's not really related to Islam, but it has like 
the poetry has the actual linguistic meaning sometimes because at that time they used to be so good in language that the linguistic meanings sometimes are embedded in the poetry so scholars use that if they have difficulty in understanding certain words they would refer to poetry and pre-islamic arab customs as well as you know the the all this qurans many times it was revealed in uh, a specific time and there were certain customs prevalent during that time right like like um, we mentioned earlier the example of what the the people who commit zihar right the uh, in surah al mujadila that was the custom that time where in men used to say women that you know in order to divorce them they would say you are like the back of my mother so they would get divorced so if you don't have that idea what really that custom is you will have no way of understanding what that is so there are a lot of customs like that and israiliyat what israiliyat is is the basically uh, stories of or you know uh, legislation or events of the previous generations so usually what happens is we have quran hadith and all these sources this is sufficient in and of itself but scholars sometimes refer to stories from or stories of prophets from uh, previous nations for example if they want to know more about musa alay salam and isa alay salam and their laws and how they lived and so on the bible and torah and all these books they have they have all this information with them and they have lot of stories along with it so those are called israiliyat the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he told them he told us that uh, you know don't reject israiliyat but don't accept blindly israiliyat so we have to take it with you know uh, with we have to see if it contradicts with quran and sunna or not and we cannot reject it because uh, again the torah the the uh, and the bible the injil the original injil they all came from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala itself is it not so some of it is actually true so we cannot completely reject it so some of the stories has been preserved or everything and in, up, up to this day all the mufassir use the uh, israiliyat and some of it is of course really uh, false and fabrications uh, we know that but some of them that might be true we take it and use it in the tafsir and most of the scholars especially during our times they are resorting to personal opinion meaning that you know they take a verse and try to make ishtihad and they say okay this verse also means these and this is how it applies in the current situation so this is what a uh, personal opinion means